we look back at um, um, history, if you like, or, or cultural history, if I may say so, um, herbal medicine, or as we call it, Tibb Arabi, it is really Arabic medicine, if you want the, if this is the true <laughs> translation. Um, the Tibb Arabi is used um, by the Arabs um, for themselves, for their children, as far back as, as um, you know, uh, um, time goes. Uh, um, of course, in in, um, in, in our uh, history, there are many uh, um, people who were very famous for their um, medicinal, uh, uh, if you like, medicinal history. Um, Razi, I think, is, is of course, um, one of the, the um, most uh, well-known. But it's also, um, used as, as herbs, uh, as medicinal plants, and also used for bones, for healing, for arthritis, for broken bones. That is also another uh, uh, form, if, if I may say so, of the Tibb al-Arabi, of Arabic medicine. Um, and there are specialized people, like the herbalist that you visited with, there are specialized people for healing uh, broken bones or uh, um, sprained, uh, muscular pains, for rheumatism, for arthritis, that's another field of its own. But you see, a day in the Badia in the spring, I, I do, would, would imagine is, um, to me at least, it's like being, spending the day in heaven. Um, the beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. You could look and, and see a beautiful sunrise and not see a green um, twig for, for miles and miles. But when you see one, that's, that's a treasure. That's something remarkable. That's a gift from God. And you admire that plant or that flower or whatever it is for all the battle it went through just to bloom. And it bloomed for you. That, that is something fantastic. At the same time, you could turn a corner and go down a wadi and you'll see a carpet of uh, um, stock of um, maybe even sometimes some poppies uh, and maybe sometimes not flowers as such, but just herbs, um, some sage in bloom, some uh, oregano, some thyme. Um, it, it is there and, and um, when you see it all in bloom, it's truly a carpet but a carpet of, of treasure. It's like um, looking at, a, at um, a wonder, a vault of wonders, perhaps a vault of, of jewels. Each one is a jewel because it has um, been there for goodness knows how long and we hope it will be there for uh, even a longer time. But it's how many people are going to benefit uh, from a small sage or a small uh, uh, um, oregano or thyme or whatever it is. Um, you take a look and you say, ah, isn't it a wonderful feeling um, that this can actually happen in this part of uh, the country. And that's the reason why I get so upset when people describe the Badia as a desert. It is not a desert. It is a semi-arid land that needs a lot of tender, loving care. The people you know, they are the ones that are using this plant, they are the ones that have used this plant for as old as time. Um, the other is um, how can we make sure that this is protected, if you like, and at the same time um, not exploit um, it. It is a little, a little bit of a, um, let's say, a difficult issue, but then again, um, there's, there's um, many solutions, I'm sure, that can be put forward. Um, the, the principle of taking something from the Badia and putting something back was really the core um, issue that helped us to set up um, what we call the Friends of the Badia Fund. And um, the principle is that whoever you are, you have taken something out of the Badia. Isn't it about time to put something back? And the way to do that is by contribution. We are doing science research in semi-arid land. Research needs all the support it can get. So this is um, any research that we go into with any of the scientists, this is one point that um, has to be agreed on. 
if this research was to lead to a certain product, that rights are reserved and um, are agreed upon, and there's certain uh, legal uh, documents that are signed at the beginning. So it, I think it clears the way for everybody. Of course we want um, uh, our research to continue, but at the same time we have to keep a careful eye of how this research can continue, providing that um, this careful eye is looked into uh, um, or looked at protecting the rights of the people. And I think it's, it's the people that count at the end of the day. You know. um, some of the people you've visited have been practicing. Um, they are herbalists, they've been practicing for 40 or 50 years. Their knowledge came probably from a mother or a grandmother. Um, don't these people have rights? Shouldn't somebody be out there protecting those rights for them? So to me, it's, it's not an evil practice. What becomes um, iffy is when cultures lose information and then have to buy it back. If they're prevented from participating in the full benefits of the development for, at any number of levels, that becomes a problem. We don't want to treat anyone else in a way we would not like to be treated. So if we have information, we want to be recompensed for it. If we develop materials, we want to be supported for that. And so we want to be sure that the indigenous peoples are valued for their contribution, both because that will ensure that they give us good information, as well as that they then have access, equal and fair access, to the medicines that are appropriate for them. Sometimes students will come to my office to be interviewed for working in research labs, and when I describe the project to them, the medicinal plants project, they'll say, oh yeah, my grandmother made me a tea whenever I had a stomach ache, or I had this when I had a headache, or all of these um, times in their childhood and even into their adulthood, they were given preparations made from regional plants to make them feel better. These were quality of life medications, these were not, you know, trauma events usually, but they were a natural, appropriate treatment that the families automatically gravitated Excuse to me. and used. We got the we cover everything. We go from anthropology to zoology, I would have to say. Um, we start out, because the, the basis or the hypothesis is that if you use plants as a source of drugs that have been identified by cultures as being important medical agents, you increase the odds of finding efficacious chemistries two to threefold. So the drug companies know this factor. Um, medical communities understand this. So what we're, what we're hoping to show is that um, students will learn how to develop, how drugs are developed by studying the whole process of chemical uh, syntheses, chemical extractions, the analytical tools, and then testing those um, chemistries for their efficacy. An Anti-cancer drugs, or at least many of them, are derived from natural sources, plants and, and microorganisms. So over the millennia that evolution has worked on these, on these sources, they have developed very sophisticated um, 
pathways to produce small molecules, what we know as drugs. And uh, that evolutionary process has yielded things that are very specific in their action. Um, what we're trying to do is to, to discover whether that specificity is useful in, in the treatment of cancer. That's great. For a hundred specific diseases, specific indications that we call cancer, that we collectively call cancer, and those all have unique genetic fingerprints. So the likelihood that any single drug will um, be active against the whole spectrum of tumors is, is small. Uh, what we're trying to do is now find, match specific medicines with spe specific genetic fingerprints um, to treat cancers. That's wonderful. I know that you know about your vision and uh, technology medicines. That sometimes those medicines are very expensive. Uh, you know, see, we have cough syrup. Will cost fifty dollars, ten dollars. And you know, a mom can can uh, prepare cough syrup in her kitchen. Just combine some bee honey, some some lemon juice, and some herbal that we have available here in the area, like eucalyptus, you know, like uh, oregano, some little bit of garlic and, and bee honey, and we'll have an excellent, an excellent cough syrup. Besides that, as the actor, we understand that liquids are the best fluidificant for the phlegm. So if I tell the mom that the child needs to drink more fluids. Maybe they will not understand, but if I tell them, well, make this infusion and give them a cup every three hours, they'll do it. And it works. It's going to be our fourth year working in this community. And I can tell you very proudly that now it's not only myself. We have two more GPs that joined the group, and we have two dentists that are working on a regular basis. We work from Monday through Saturday, every day of the year, and uh, we do not observe uh, holidays but besides the Christmas and, and Eastern, but um, we start serving here, you know, expecting to see a few families, at least to help the poorest of the poor, and now we are growing so much that we have close to 7,000 families coming to this clinic on a daily basis and you name it, from babies to 90 years old. People, pregnant moms, you know, emergencies and dental problems. And one of the reasons that we have been so successful is because we have social service available to the people, you know, and we welcome the people that is in desperate situations. People that cannot pay is welcome. The doors are open, including the dental area. Research has shown that uh, this island uh, possesses a great deal of uh, endemism, that is, organisms that only occur here. And we're talking about uh, at least 50 uh, sea snails. I have cataloged over 150 endemic species on the island, terrestrial and marine, that are found only in Curaçao and or Aruba and Bonaire. So these islands are unique in terms of biodiversity and richness of unique species. These kinds of bays with the seagrasses and the mangroves play a critical role as nursery areas for commercially important reef fish like the yellowtail snapper, the gray snapper, the schoolmaster snapper, and other snappers, grunts, barracuda, and lobsters. We have studies documenting coral declines in diversity from 1960 to 1992 and uh, coral growth rate decreases, dramatic uh, growth rate decreases. When I was uh, young, uh, 30 years ago, and paddled around here as a kid, these shallow areas were studded with big colonies of Cedarastrea, Cedarea, big orange colonies. You can see the dead colonies right there, right now. They're all dead. These were big colonies of coral, uh, teeming with uh, lobsters and small fish, and that's all gone now. So. If we continue along this trend, we'll lose even uh, the remaining values that have, uh, which are considerable, I should say. Jo wili vota vai kuminda jo pami. Jo wili vota vai kuminda jo pami. So mira jo kuminda le pami. O jo wili vota vai kuminda jo pami. So mira jo kuminda le pami. Oh, Willie, ah, hey, yo, Willie, ah, hey. Oh, Willie, ah, hey, yo, Willie, ah, hey. Tabo malogang, 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 tabo malogang.
From the arid U.S. Mexico borderlands to the Scarpa Desert of the Middle East, traditional people have shared themselves with as medicinal plants for centuries. The same holds true for those on the dry Caribbean island of Curaçao. This is my garden of medicinal herbs. It's called Demparadera. Demparadera comes from Parajiri. Parajiri Indians who long ago had one of the biggest gardens of these islands. But since those early days, Curaçao has grown. Now, some of these natural medicinal wonders are threatened, both on the land and coastal waters. What's at stake is the promise that some of these plants might hold the secret for future medical cures. On land, the Divi Divi tree has shown a remarkable ability to fight staph infections. Underwater, a local algae called mermaid's hair has proven to have strong anti-cancer properties. So it's pretty amazing to think that an algae growing under a mangrove in a little bay on the west coast of Curaçao in the middle of the Caribbean could in fact yield a compound that ultimately could be used to treat cancer. As science races against time, new discoveries based on age-old knowledge continues. It is an extraordinary convergence of ancient roots, modern medicine. This is the southern Caribbean island of Curaçao. Its arid limestone terrain is harsh, at times almost desolate. People have braved this sun-beaten, dry land for centuries, mastering the use of its sparse vegetation. And for some, this tradition continues even now. This is the Loki Loki. You know, it's a very s nice plant. When you have very much sun, it will close the leaves, you know, and so take like, a, like looking for shade. Um, we use it for when we have a headache, so you can take little bits, you know, and do it around the heart. And it's, it's very, very good for people with headaches. This is Dina Firis. Today she is collecting medicinal plants from hilltops in the middle of the island. Dina is known throughout Curaçao as a healer, or in the local language of Papiamento, a curioso. She will take these plants home and make blends of herbal medicine to sell. Her knowledge of the local botany is impressive. This is called the Barba di Menishi, or the Marie di Palu, of Barba di Caduci. Um, it grows like a parasite on the plant. And this we use for when people have gallbladder problems. We use this one. I give my knowledge away because I got it from the older people. They gave me their knowledge. And I feel that I have to give that knowledge to other people, to young people, so they can spread it. Besides collecting medicinal plants, Dina is on a mission to also preserve them. In the early 1980s, she began Den Paradera, a magnificent botanical garden where she propagates over 300 species. When Dina was unable to find certain types on Curaçao, she traveled to the neighboring islands of Bonaire and Aruba, where the plants had not yet been eliminated from the landscape. 
Yes, I started in Paradera because I, I saw that we were losing a lot of information, a lot of herbs. You could be today here and, f and see a lot of herbs. The next day you will be um, not finding them anymore. So I started to, to bring the herbs to this garden, to keep the knowledge. The garden is very important to me because I cultivate the medicinal herbs. So we can know the stories, we can know what kind of herbs we have on this island and also to learn how to use it. It will be a pity that we lose all the information of the uses of the culture, you know, because people don't know how to use uh, the herbs. The garden is divided in three parts, the botanical part, the historical part and the production. The botanical parts are the herbs divided in sections for the digestion, for the heart, for the respiratory system. You know, when I started, the people, the people thought I was crazy because I had a good job. Why should I go and make my hands dirt with the land? So they thought, you know. But I had that dream that I needed to, to conserve the culture, to conserve the information and to have the plans. So um, I went on. Even if, if people were, were laughing, it didn't matter. The slaves, when they came here, they brought seeds, you know. Nobody knew that they had the seeds with them. They wanted to survive. They didn't know where they were going, you know. And also, when they were here, they could recognize some of the trees and plants that they had in Africa. There were people who know the medicinal healing, so as uh, the medicinal doctors, you know, the medical, the, the healing doctors, so they could go to those um, healing doctors so they could find help. Here in the Kurahulanda Museum in nearby Willemstadt, actors from the Living History Theatre Group portray plantation life and the tragic plight of the captured Africans. Experts estimate that during the 18th and 19th centuries, millions of people were enslaved along Africa's western coast. The Dutch, in need of securing their new colony, used slave ships to cross the 5,000 miles of treacherous sea. It was a long, arduous journey to reach the tiny island of Curaçao. Yeah, the slaves arrived here on front of the building and uh, they were unshipped here. You must imagine they were on the ship for six to eight weeks, but most of them... Leo Helms is the director of the Kurahulanda Museum, which is built on the very site of Curaçao's old slave market. Uh, and they were very weak and in a very bad condition when they arrived here. And then <coughs> they stayed here on the property for one or two, two months, yeah, to get a little bit more stronger. They sent them out to the other mansions on the island to be trained how to work on the plantations. From here they were shipped to Cuba and North America. Those that stayed behind in Curaçao learned how to adapt to their new life. Many had come from rich West African kingdoms, proud civilizations that had thrived in Mother Africa. Even though the slaves suffered unimaginable hardships, many of their old customs endured. So did their ancient knowledge of medicinal plants. Come on in. Have a seat. The old wisdom of medicinal plant use is still practiced at Den Paradera. This Curaçao woman, Sonia, is back for a visit. Like many from the Dutch Antilles, she now lives in the Netherlands. Sonia has experienced severe respiratory problems for the past two years, and modern medicines have failed to cure her. She has turned to Dina for help. Just wait here. I will go get the herbs for you. In her kitchen, Dina prepares several medicines made from medicinal plants to cure Sonia's ailment. 
They are old recipes passed on to her by island elders. In the beginning, when doctors know that I was working, you know, with the plants, they laughed at me. But sometimes I had doctors here in the garden and they still asking questions. But nowadays, I mean, I'm accepted on this island. I know people come for advice. I can call a doctor. They know me and I can ask what's the best medicine at this moment are herbs the best because I believe that we have to work together. With Sonia's treatment complete, Dina leaves Den Paradera for a visit with some of her old friends. First on Dina's list today is to visit Sister Carmen. Sister Carmen came formally to iron my clothes. She was one of the number of healers that Dina chronicled in her book, Green Remedies and Golden Customs of Our Ancestors. So then we started to talk. I noticed that she knew a lot about herbs and that she wanted to conserve the herbs and that in her garden she had some herbs. So when she was ironing, I was asking. So I could sit with her for hours and hours and learning from, from Sister Carmen. What is this plant? This is Yerba de Ole. When a child has a fever, you can put it on their feet or you can give it to them as a tea. How do they do that? They mash it up and mix it with coconut oil and put it on the feet. They also put it behind the ear? Yes, the herb relieves the problem. Dina also stops by the home of another wise elder by the name of Cha-Cha. Herbs are always good. Like chamomile, it will cleanse the insides. The sandura is always good for the stomach. Morning is the best time to drink herbs. This will give you a good appetite. If you have gas in your belly, you drink your mampuritu and you will get rid of the gas. I had a very good time with the chacha because she has been learning from her aunt of her mother. So she, she knew a lot about medicinal herbs. There are herbs that used to be easy to find. Now you don't see them anymore. Mampuritu is like that. You don't even see it in the schoolyards. It's all gone. It was important for Dina to document the wise words of these elders, for their generation has nearly vanished. Today, few young islanders show much interest in medicinal plants. What we need is people, young people, to learn the herbs from this country. At this moment, you see that plants and medicinal herbs are coming from Colombia, Venezuela, and Santo Domingo. A lot of them are sold on the market. I don't feel very well about that because it's, it's not the same culture as that of Curaçao. You can see on the market, it's dominating the culture of, of the island. There is more to Curaçao than its fanciful harbor front facade that greets incoming cruise ships. This city has the deepest harbor in the West Indies, making it a regional center for maritime commerce. Like many islands throughout the Caribbean, Curaçao is modernizing. 
Most people here enjoy the conveniences of modern drugs, doctors, and medical facilities. Because of this, much of the ancient knowledge of medicinal plants is being left behind. But the cultural legacy of healers like Sister Carmen and Chacha is not the only thing that is threatened. The wild places where medicinal plants grow are also under attack from urbanization, industrial expansion, and increased development. More people and more growth are beginning to tax the Kanuku, Curaçao's fragile, arid countryside. Dina makes one more stop before returning home to Den Paradera. She heads for one of her favorite spots near the sea. Dina has become increasingly worried as the numbers of wild medicinal plants dwindle each year. She blames the oil refineries in part for upsetting the ecological balance. I'm very concerned. When the oil company came, they pumped a lot of water. So the water got down and people can make wells whenever they want. There are no rules. So we are losing the water that's under the ground. This year it was very, very hot. Almost one year, no rain. So we are losing very old trees who are more than 200 years old. But Dina Ferris is not alone in her concern for the botanical wonders of Curaçao. Here, high on the slopes of Cristofel National Park, biologist John De Freitas searches for plants that hold potential medicinal cures. He works for a local institute called CARMABI, the Caribbean Marine Biological Foundation. They are doing baseline science, attempting to catalog the island's 500 plus plant species. The list has been cut to about 100 that show bacteria fighting properties. Here we have a number of endemic species. Endemic means uh, that they only occur or on only on Curaçao or on the leeward islands of the Netherlands and Thales that comprises uh, not only Curaçao but also Bonaire and Aruba. One such unique species, called Eugenia, is one of two rare plants that interests Defratis due to its strong antibacterial tendencies. The name of this plant is Eugenia procera. It's only found in the Caribbean. And on Curaçao, it's mostly found in the Christopher Park and is part of the Mitaceae family, to which also the eucalyptus tree belongs. John also gathers samples of the Divi Divi tree while on the mountain slope. It has shown a remarkable ability to fight staph infections. And there is a story of an old man, and he has very good eyesight, and he says that's uh, due to the fact that he uses the Divi Divi leaves as an eye wash every morning. So that's a very interesting uh, <laughs> connotation. DVD was active against several microorganisms at also the highest level of activity. So it's a very interesting result. As John makes his way off Mount Christoffel, his work with Eugenia and the Divi Divi is just beginning. Back at the Karmabi Institute, the samples are dried. For those used in antimicrobial testing, ovens are used to speed up the process. For other samples that require examination of essential oils, the plants are spread out on a table. This drying process can take up to two weeks, and then the tests begin. Yes, these are the results of the uh, ten layer chromatography of the plants we screened for uh, antimicrobial properties. And to date, De Freitas' study has shown some promising results. A number of plants, including Eugenia and the Divi Divi, have shown strong activity against bacteria. This baseline science could lead other researchers in developing modern medicines based on the power of these ancient roots, stems, and leaves. In the year 2000, a study by Conservation International declared the Caribbean as one of the world's biodiversity hotspots, areas rich with flora and fauna of unique qualities. Curaçao, in spite of its arid terrain, is surprisingly biodiverse. But John, like Dina Firas, is concerned with the island's future. 
I'm concerned that certain areas that, that harbor certain plants, uh, unique plant species that doesn't occur anywhere else on the island, it would be a um, pity that those areas would be destroyed for uh, economic development. If you destroy those areas, you won't have them back. And it will be t take many decades for um, to create areas similar to those with those uh, characteristics. That's why um, it's very important for these islands to look ahead and take into account conservation of these areas. But not all of the island's natural medicinal wealth lies on the land. In the early 1990s, American researcher Bill Gerwick discovered a blue-green algae called Lingia majuscula, or mermaid's hair. Bill was able to isolate a chemical compound from the algae that he named Curacin A, in honor of Curacao. Early clinical studies showed that it had powerful anti-cancer properties. Today, Bill and his wife Lena, along with a crew from the Karmabi Institute, are getting ready to travel back to where this one-of-a-kind algae was discovered over a decade ago. We made some of our first collections uh, back in uh, December 1991, and we found that Curacao was very receptive to our coming and exploring their biodiversity for compounds that might be useful to treat uh, human diseases. The particular bay that we've come to focus on is uh, called Spanish Water. So uh, what's really unique about the Spanish Waters Bay is that uh, the blue-green algae growing there, it's, all, it's known as Lingvia majuscula. You can find Lingvia majuscula in other bays nearby. But when we looked at the Lingvia majuscula from the other bays, they didn't produce the same compounds. They produced other compounds that were quite interesting, but they didn't produce Curacin A. You dive a computer or what? No, I don't. This is a shallow dive, so. And it'll be less than an hour. No scorpions in there. <laughs> That's always nice to know. Gerwick and researcher Dolphy de Brot from Carmabi don their diving gear to revisit the rich collection site where the special algae was originally found. It's been several years since Bill collected here and he is anxious to see what's below. This uh, mermaid's hair, or lingvia majuscula, as we know it in scientific terms, it's really quite a remarkable organism because it's actually a bacterium, but a giant bacterium. From the mangrove roots, it has one kind of a color. It's growing uh, somewhat back underneath the mangroves, growing down as trellises. Uh, they're kind of uh, uh, fluffy and have a, a really quite uh, beautiful reddish color oftentimes. The buried treasure here on this island though may not be on land, it may be in the sea. It may be some of these algae are creating molecules that will be enormously useful in uh, helping human society. Hey, that was some great stuff there. We got some good samples. Back on deck, Gerwick eagerly pulls out his field microscope and inspects the new collection. These red hairs when we see them in the field, but here you can see that they're actually a whole series of little pancakes or coins stacked into these long filaments, and they're all encased in that uh, sheath-like material. That's really quite a remarkable organism. It's been really uh, nice to see that those algae are still living in that environment and are still quite healthy. So uh, this is the treasure trove of natural products that we've been studying for the last uh, nearly 15 years now. It's absolutely amazing the, the uh, diversity and biological activity of the compounds that this little seaweed's making. But after the excitement of the moment, Bill discovers a disturbing change in Spanish water. As their boat slowly leaves the bay, the beginnings of a new coastline development come into view. 
really sad and really hard for me to see because it's going to destroy this habitat. This habitat that is very small and very unique and it's giving, given rise to this unique organism. We've not seen this organism anywhere else in the world. It will look just like it does over here. They're going to put in houses and docks and a marina and these kinds of things and it's going to substantially alter this habitat. I would fully expect the organism to disappear. So uh, when I see this kind of development going on and uh, uh, it just really alarms me because what they're doing is they're taking their future, this treasure trove of species and, and chemistry, and they're bulldozing it down. And we may never unearth this treasure again. The, the problem is that the uh, shoreline areas uh, are an integral part of your marine ecosystem. Particularly when you're urbanizing areas like this, you're going to put in uh, native, uh, non-native uh, trees that require pesticides to maintain. You're going to be putting in lawns with a great deal of, of water. They'll require uh, nutrients, that is, fertilizers uh, and uh, pesticides to maintain them too. And as a consequence, all that stuff leaches into the bay and destroys the habitat, contaminates it. The current island development plan, which was approved in 1997, approves about 90% of the shorelines of this bay for uh, urban uses and that will mean that this bay will essentially turn into an urban cesspool with just lined with homes no scenery no nature left and a mishmash of boats zooming around and we already are facing uh, human health related water quality problems in parts of the bay during parts of the year I can take you diving on that side of the bay and then we'll see beautiful white bottoms uh, ocean floor, but not due to white sand, which it should be, but due to toilet paper. Not only is the future of mermaid's hair in jeopardy, but Curasan A, its cancer-fighting compound, is also facing challenges in the laboratory. Initial tests were promising and showed the substance to be highly toxic to cancerous cells. But in later experiments at the National Cancer Institute in Bethesda, Maryland, Curacin A was found to have solubility issues and was unstable when tested in mice. These problems were a major setback for the development of the compound into a modern drug. And that said to us that the compound was unstable under the conditions of the, the body. So that has led subsequently now to an effort to refine that structure, make it a better molecule. And that's what we really should be looking to in nature. We should be looking for new ideas, new chemical templates, that we're going to take that new chemical structure from the seaweed and we're going to translate it into a molecule that's going to be an efficacious drug. We need to improve its water solubility and its stability in the body. And those efforts are taking place right now in various laboratories around the world. One such place is here at the University of Pittsburgh, where chemistry professor Peter Witt has taken on the structural challenges of Curacin A. The molecule was uh, significant and interesting for us because it targeted a part of the uh, biological machinery within the cell that's quite crucial for its growth, particularly in cancer cells. Basically, cancer cells are very similar to normal cells. And that's why it's so difficult to develop effective uh, anti-cancer agents. Uh, but what we'd like to do is use the ability of structures such as QSNA and the analogs that are developed on this basis to basically to move cancer cells into what's called apoptosis or programmed cell death, you know, cell suicide. Hello, Jane. How's it going? But first, Professor Whiff and his students had to tackle the inherent problems of QSNA. They overcame the solubility issue making a chemical hybrid structure, much like other drug-like molecules that dissolve easily in water. They also solve the compound's sensitivity to light. It's a molecular tinker toy set, and we are able to build just about anything we'd like to build. And that's very satisfying, very challenging. You can truly take your visions and test them with the potential goal, of course, of improving uh, the environment, improving human health, improving living in general.
Even though the new compound based on curacin A showed increased biological activity, it faced another problem when tested with lab animals. The compound metabolized too quickly due to the animal's enzymes, not allowing it time enough to attack the tumor. So we now know where the uh, sensitive parts of the molecule are. And so we can address the problems in terms of stability towards the uh, biological environment when the compound is actually given to an animal and is in the blood of an animal. But ultimately we hope that then we will have indeed a compound that in the mouse will basically make human tumors disappear. But that's just the mouse system. So from there on you have to go to a higher animal and reproduce the same finding. To make a modern drug from a natural substance is a long process, one full of delays and challenges. Peter Wick estimates that the development takes two to seven years. That's not including the clinical trials that can take up to a decade before the drug is finally released to the public. We really would like to uh, see curious in a analogs move into the clinic and uh, test the hypothesis that we can develop an anti-cancer agent at the molecular level uh, that has the kind of effect that we're predicting, stopping cell division and uh, moving cancer cells selectively into cell suicide. We hope we can accomplish that, uh, uh, but even if we don't get to the final drug molecule, we hope we can learn a lot about the process, so maybe with another natural products next time around, we'll be able to go all the way. So we have all this information, we can follow a single compound very well, uh, but still a huge challenge and something that um, uh, you know, makes us very modest again is the fact that very often in the end we cannot explain really what's going on. Uh, so we can see that some of these uh, uses of uh, the traditional medicine, the folk medicine, that they're very valid. If you look at the big picture, at the overall organisms, people do feel better, they can get better quite well. Back on Curaçao, Dina Firis continues her one-woman crusade to save the traditional knowledge of island medicine and the desert's botanical wealth. If the convergence of ancient roots and modern medicine is to continue, people like Dina are essential human links in this vital process. The future for medicinal plants of, of, in Curaçao is the hope that I have, the hope that young people can go on with this, the hope that my children will learn to be able to spread that my grandchildren would be able to know the herbs from the garden and the earth from the mountain. That's the biggest joy I will have. For more information on ancient roots, modern medicine, log on to www.rootsandmedicine.com.